Ezekiel has a vision of a valley full of bones, receiving life, breath, sinew, and flesh after encountering the Word of God. When they arise, they receive spirit and they dance. As Easter people, we celebrate the spirit that continues to give life and breath to our dry bones. We dare to dance in the face of fear, in the face of cynicism, in the face of despair. We dare to dance as long as we live, for we, like the early Christians, are the recipients of the Spirit of God, which intercedes even when we think we can't make it to the dance floor. Dare to dance with dreamers, sing their song. Dare to dance their stories, sing out strong. Dare to dance with freedom your whole life long. Dare to dance again. The day of Pentecost has arrived and calls us to dance, to dance in the wind and fire of the Spirit, to feel, to allow exuberance to fill our bodies and souls. With those in Jerusalem on that day, may we dare to dream, to imagine, to let our breath be taken away, and to dance. song dare to dance their stories sing out strong dare to dance with freedom your whole life long dare to dance again this is the call the flames of the spirit are beckoning we lift up our heads to meet the day our focus is on the future and what we might do together we fortify our hearts with compassion and action. When rain comes again, we will open the umbrellas of joy and set out anyway. For we are called to dance again. Oh. 
their song. Dare to dance their story, sing out strong. Dare to dance with freedom your whole life long. Dare to dance again. A reading from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 12. And verse 14, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out by the spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. God led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley and they were very dry. God said to me, mortal, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. And God said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied. As I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews upon them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then God said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as God commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then God said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are completely cut off. Therefore, prophecy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. A reading taken from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. People of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. 
in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you ever thought of God as one who has a dream for us, for human beings? Well, it's true. We can see it many times in the stories of the Bible. First, in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, God dreams up a whole world. Nothing existed, and God dreamt, and so it was. And then, when people were mistreated and held captive, God dreamed of making them free. The book of Exodus says that God called a man named Moses to help with the dream, and Moses did. He went to the king and told him to set the people free. And he did. And God dreamed of coming to the world so that we could see for ourselves just what God's dream for us looks like. And Jesus was born. Jesus was born and grew up and showed us the very dream of God in flesh and blood, just like us. And there's more. God dreamt of a way to be not only with us, like in the real person of Jesus, but to live within us within us to join the very being of God with our own souls. The Holy Spirit lives within us because God first imagined it as a way to be closer than close to us, to be right there all the time. God the Dreamer. Our colorful umbrellas this season have been a sign of joy and hope, even on rainy days. My prayer for you is that whenever you see an umbrella throughout your whole life, you will remember this time we've had together with our colorful umbrellas. And you will see each umbrella as a sign of God's message. What message is that, you might ask? God's message to us is this. Dream big, my friends. Dream big. Dream big. Dream big, my friends. On a day like today, perhaps dreaming big is easy for us to imagine, for it is a day when we are able to return to in-person worship after a long, long time, a time that we have been physically separated, literally pulled apart by a virus that has run rampant across our entire world. It has been a long, long year plus a long year plus. And gathering together today offers to give us an extraordinary, exhilarating, wonderful feeling. Now, when the congregation suggested that this day be the day that we reopened to regathering almost over a month ago now, I thought about the poetic parallel that it was that the day that it falls on, on our church calendar. Because today is Pentecost. I don't know if you're noticing red is the color today. It's a day that comes around only once a year, and it celebrates something extraordinary that took place among our first disciples. 
so extraordinary, in fact, that it launched a movement, a movement that we continue to follow, the life and the ministry and the mission of Jesus in the world. Our reading from Acts today gives us a glimpse of the excitement and perhaps renews our hope in the new life that the first disciples felt and found. There's so much connection and symbolism woven into this short reading that it's important for us to take a moment to lay out some groundwork because the day itself was already a special day long before our reading because the whole community, including the disciples, would travel great distances every year to celebrate the day of Pentecost or Shavuot, Shavuot. Shavuot began as a day set aside once a year to offer thanksgiving for the first fruits of the harvest. Springtime makes sense, right? And so as the events in our reading were taking place, it also aligned with the first fruits of the harvest, a harvest of a new kind, a harvest of people, a people born of the Spirit, a people born into the love and life of Jesus Christ. And then there's this idea of wind. We've been talking about that a lot over the past few weeks. Wind. Wind can be a literary device for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. For the same Spirit that we read blew across Genesis, blowing across the dawn of creation, also soars over the disciples that day. The Spirit is anxiously and joyously anticipating the new things that God is ushering into the world, not only at the beginning of time, not only on that day of Pentecost, but each and every day. We feel a breeze, breathe it in. Language. The disciples' ability to be able to speak in the mother tongue of all of those who were gathered, and they talked about people from all over the world, their world at the time, could understand what it was they were saying. Now, we aren't quite clear exactly how that mysterious language translation took place, but we are clear that something amazing happened something that somehow allowed in some way, shape, or form for God to find a way to bring people from all over together, even among their diversity, even among all their differences and barriers that separated them. Fire is our last symbol that we're going to be talking about today. The flames that are kind of mysteriously described as resting over the disciples Well, it could represent an inauguration of a different way of understanding how we are able to access God. For up until this point in time, it was understood that the only way to access God was to go to a certain location and go through certain traditions and rituals. In essence, the way that the fire is used in this writing, it could compare to this aha moment that something new is happening. For up until then, they thought they had to go to a certain location. But now, now as the fire moved over the disciples in a way that's described as fire over each of their heads, depending on the reading, It could symbolize the relocation of this special connection. The fire of God is moving out into the world. The fire is in the hearts and the minds and the spirits of the disciples. God can be found among, around, and within the lives of the disciples. The disciples then and now within us. That kind of connects us to our sermon last week where we talked about we are the hands and the feet and the heart and the mouth of Jesus walking on the streets today. The symbolism in our reading 
might help us, perhaps a little, perhaps a lot, relate more fully to what all of this means to us all of these years later as we gather together on a special day like today especially after a difficult, tumultuous year, and as we continue to perhaps carry some worry and anxiety that still lingers over where this virus is taking us. For we have traveled a long, winding, and difficult road over this past year plus. And as we look out over the horizon, we aren't really sure what we see there either. For much has changed. Even our worship has changed. Even we as individuals have changed. The disciples in our Acts reading are also experiencing and gathering during a time that they had been on a long and winding and difficult journey. If you think back to Palm Sunday, the events that they experienced that day, the celebration between then and now, all of the twists and turns that they have been taking, from the joyous welcoming into Jerusalem to the fear that they felt when Jesus was arrested and put on trial, and then the horror, the horror and the agonizing grief of watching him die, and then the emptiness of the tomb. And then the joy of his resurrection. And then the satisfaction, the satisfaction of his companionship as he walked amongst them after he had been resurrected. And then finally, last week, his ascension into the heavens, which I imagine left them feeling all sorts of what? A roller coaster of emotions, right? They gathered as a part of tradition, something that was repeated on a regular basis, something that was familiar, but they came as different people. They gathered together in a time that everything was different. Everything had changed. For everything they knew and believed had been turned over and over and over again, kind of like the roller coaster rides that some will be taking this summer, until it landed them in a different time, it landed them in a different truth, it landed them in a completely new life. Their previous understandings of God had been taken apart much like, and Anne can agree with me here, much like happens when we're in seminary, their understandings were taken apart and inverted and then reconstructed. And they were perhaps left feeling the way that the reading from Ezekiel today described, as if they were left with only dry, dry, dry bones, nothing but brittle, nothing but brokenness, lost in a valley with nothing left to help them get into tomorrow. They needed the experience that we read about today in Acts. So let's listen to the reading and the opening words of the reading one more time. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly, suddenly from the heaven there came a sound, like the rush of a violent wind. This is what I call the spirit movement. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Something extraordinary grabbed their attention that day. Perhaps the breath of the spirit was just what was needed to fill them with a breath of hope. But indeed, whatever it was, something changed within them. And everyone that was standing around could see it. And somehow, in some marvelous kind of way, people from many different cultures, speaking many different languages, were able to understand and connect with them. They were able to connect with what it was they had to say, what it was that they had to offer others. 
In this revelation, this revelation must have awakened something, something deep inside of the disciples, something that allowed the life of Christ to pulsate within them to pulsate around them and through them. This awakening, this uncontainable life, it continues. It continues. Can we feel it today? Can we hear it? Do we hear it in the sounds of the children kind of singing in their own voices? Do we hear it as we or feel it as we sit next to those who we haven't gathered with in over a year? Do we feel it when we sense new friends that we have yet to get to know? Is it pulsating within us? Now, of course, there are ebbs and flows on this life's journey. And that brings us extreme highs and extreme lows. But as we regather today, perhaps we can relate just a bit more fully to the inexhaustible excitement that the disciples felt that day. For it was a time that burst forth like a wildfire from all aspects of their life. It was a movement, it was a movement that birthed the church. It was a movement that brought the life and the love of Christ to every generation. Every generation that has followed all the way to us today. Now that movement, that wildfire, that uncontainable life continues. It continues with you and you and you and me. So the question that lays before us today is this. What causes us to feel enthused? What causes us to feel joyful and amazed about the experiences that we are given within church, as a church, as a movement? For there is so much life and love and hope that we are given as we gather together as one in Christ. So let's follow the disciples. Let's follow their lead. Let's open ourselves to the spirit that is beckoning us. Let's open ourselves to the fire that is burning within us. And let's allow ourselves to be blown out the doors of this church, so to speak. Let's pour out into the streets with enthusiasm. The enthusiasm of inexplicable hope and uncontainable life. Let's allow today to be a day that we awaken. That we awaken like we never have awakened before. That something about us speaks like fireworks, gets people's attention in ways that everyone around us will notice that something, something has changed. Let's allow ourselves to be noticed in a way that others will be able to recognize God's voice, Jesus' presence, walking on our feet, using our hands talking with our mouths, loving with our hearts. For today is indeed a day to celebrate and let loose. So let's open ourselves to embracing the fire of the Spirit, attempting to see her anew as we watch a brief Pentecost video that will help us maybe hone in on the moment. Look, do you see her? Sacred spirit, 
that danced and breathed over the deep before the beginning of things. Restless breath of God that makes ordinary people into prophets and witnesses to the divine. Holy flame that burns but does not consume, that refines, that inspires, that transforms. Do you see her? She danced through the ancient days. She danced among the disciples as they waited. She danced in the space above and around. She danced on their tongues and they began to speak. and proclaimed the wonders of God in every language, sacred flame. She danced and the church was born. The church began to move and breathe the fire of love, the body of Christ born of the spirit and bound together creating 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 the church we are becoming 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 the church she is not done creating we are not done becoming look do you see her? She dances still. We are not who we once were. And we are not who we shall be. Speak, holy flame. Dance, fire of love. Transform sacred breath. Guide the steps of our becoming a church into life. An inheritance not of ashes, but of fire and light. Church and spirit wrapped in power and mystery, waiting dancing. Come, Holy Spirit. And let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And fill us with your holy breath of life. And hear these prayers that lay before us today, spoken and unspoken. For the beauty of the world in all of its diversity, Holy One, we give you thanks. And we need your healing for our troubled planet, for our nation, for all who are struggling in body, mind, relationship, and spirit. And we remember those who are suffering. Teach me to pray in the power of Easter, following Christ in a life resurrected. 
teach me to act with compassion and justice. Teach me to dance with the beat of your heart. For those whom we have lost over this past year and plus. And we ask that as you soar with them in the heavens, we ask that you also soar along with us, helping us to carry on what they have given us, filling our hollowed out places and breathing new life into our lungs. Be with each of us now. And may the dance of your spirit ever call us to engage with you and to engage with the needs of those around us. And we invite you to lead us, guide us, inspire and nudge us when we need it, surround and fill us. Teach me to love with your heart of compassion. Teach me to trust in the word of your promise. Teach me to hope in the day of your coming. Teach me to dance to the beat of your heart. And we know that proclaiming resurrection and daring to dance, as we have done in this season of Easter, it doesn't stop. It it doesn't mean that all things are okay. No, for we know all things aren't, right? But it does give us the energy, the energy that we need, the energy that we need if we are to continue to dance the dance that the Spirit is leading us towards. And for those joining us from other locations and at other times, financial offerings can always be mailed in or dropped off or submitted online. But there are so many other ways, other ways that we are able to participate in this life that we are called to live. For we have a lot to offer up. We can offer up from our time and our talents and our treasures. And they're all ways that enable us to move more fully into the dance of life that we are called to live. In a moment, we are going to be dedicating all of these things that you discern and you hold up in your hearts and your minds and your spirits, even for those whose offering isn't physically in the offering plate. God knows and everything will be held up and dedicated in prayer. So let us take a moment now to discern and meditate over that which we will be joining in the dance.
And let us pray. Gracious and holy God of the dance, accept what we hold up to you today, our time, our talent, and our treasure, as well as our faltering steps, our brokenness, our leftovers, our hope, our risking, our lives. Bless and transform all that we hold up and all that we hold back, that new life may soar. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you for being here today and worshiping with us today. It's so good to be able to join together in whatever way that we are able to join together. There's a few announcements that will follow on the screens that will invite everyone to more fully engage or join in what's happening here among this congregation. For we are a church, we're a church that seeks to meet you wherever you are and whenever you are, whoever and however you find yourselves to be. Now, there was a poet, and actually when I read this poem to my dad, he said that he used to read this poet. Maria Rilke said, The designing spirit the mastermind of all things on earth, loves nothing so much in the sweeping movement of the dance as the turning point. As the turning point. The day of Pentecost, this day, is a turning point for the church, both then and now. The Spirit lives within us, 
And the Spirit still calls us into boldness and brilliance to be filled with hope and joy and love and to dance, to dance with the rhythm of the Spirit, even if that dance doesn't take the shape or form of a dance that anybody wants to see. Let us dance. Let us do things that catch people's attention and notice there's something changed, something new within you, something that's living within you. Share it. Let others feel it. And may the loving God, the risen Christ, and the dancing spirit fill you with all that you need in the days ahead. And all of God's people said, Amen. Brought out by the Spirit, led into the valley, our feet.